Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to this Q&A, Relationships Q&A, uh, Why Bother Getting Married? We're gonna talk about dating. I've been getting a lot of questions recently, so I thought maybe I'd just kind of do a Facebook Live just to kind of get things going. And also, um, I have uh, a class tomorrow night here at Chabad and DG, uh, which is gonna be, am I realistic about my dating? It's gonna be at eight o'clock here tomorrow, and so I thought, that it'll be a great opportunity for me to kind of talk to you while I'm preparing for my class tomorrow. So let's get an idea of what are some of the main issues that people have with dating. So people ask me, I'll give you an example. I just had um, a guy that calls me about five minutes ago. And he says to me, uh, I've been dating this girl and all of a sudden out of nowhere, she says to me, I don't want to see you anymore. And he's like, it's been going fine. But it's so interesting because so often we're very good at shifting the blame. We'll say that it's someone else's problem, but is it that other person's problem? Because if we're in a relationship, then there must be someone else in this relationship at the same time as me. If we're in a relationship, it must mean that I am actually an active part of this relationship. So if, there, if I'm loving this, if everything is wonderful, if everything is amazing, and all of a sudden I say, the other person saying, why isn't this amazing? So if it's wonderful for me and it's not wonderful for the other person, well, there is some kind of dichotomy in this relationship. So is it a relationship or perhaps is the relationship really feeding me? Is it feeding my selfish interests? So what I thought I'd start off with today is talking about just some of my dating tips. One of the big problems with dating is that if you get really, really good at dating, you probably don't know what marriage is because all of the mechanism, all of the ideas, everything that you need to hone in order to be a good dater is exactly the opposite of everything you need to be good at marriage. And obviously, as I'm talking, you're welcome to ask me questions. I'm happy to answer the questions live as, you're, as, a, as I'm talking to you. So I encourage you to not become good at dating. Very often, <laughs> these young women will say to me, well, you know what? The person who I'm dating is a really bad dater. And I've said, that's great. You want someone who's a bad dater because someone who's a bad dater will be a really good husband. Someone who's a bad dater will be a really good wife. And you want to find someone who's not good at dating because everything that dating is about is exactly the opposite of everything marriage is about. So if you become good at dating, the odds are you'll probably never get married. Dating is the exact opposite of marriage. And I've noticed that people who are really into dating, they don't get married. And if they do, they're probably more likely to get divorced. And if you get too comfortable with your dating, then when you get married, what ends up happening is you become confused because often you get into this relationship and you think after you're married that you're actually really still dating and you're using some of those tricks and as they call it, the dating game. You're using the dating game even though you're really married. So that's my first, my first piece of advice. Don't get good at dating. And if you're a good dater, or if you think that you're playing the game well, then probably you're not gonna get married and you're not setting yourself up for a long-lasting, healthy, and happy relationship. Number two, what about you? You need to understand who you are before you get into a relationship, before you get into uh, uh, any kind of relationship. So this person who called me before, my, uh, the odds are the reason why one person would be very happy in the relationship and the other person wouldn't be happy in the relationship is because they don't know who they are. So if you're trying to find yourself, if you're trying to find out who you really are through the relationship, you're making a huge mistake. You're not gonna, be able to marry someone or get into a relationship with someone and all of a sudden all your problems are gonna be solved. There was an idea at some point where people said, oh, well, if I get married, marriage is going to help solve my problems. Marriage is the answer to all of life's problems. So all I'm gonna do is find myself a stable person even though I'm not so stable and that person is gonna help make my life better. 
So what ends up happening is the same selfish person that thought that someone else is gonna make their life better is exactly the same selfish person who is in the relationship today. That's exactly what happens. So you need to understand who you are before you date. What's also amazing about that is self-confidence is a really attractive quality to the opposite sex. It's achieved when you start to feel good about the direction of your life. It's not a product of your beautiful face or your bulging bank account. You're simply and quietly confident in your ability to contribute something positive to the world. Who are you? What makes you tick? So often, someone will come to me and say, well, um, I want to get married or I want to get into a relationship. So I'll say, so what are you looking for? And they'll start saying, oh, I'm looking for someone who's nice. What does nice mean? What is the definition of nice? I know a lot of very nice people, but are they really good for you? Are they the opposites? Or I don't even say the opposites. Are they the complement of who you are? Is that the person that you're in a relationship with? So, or you want someone who's smart, or you want someone who is beautiful, or someone who's wealthy. And all these are words that are really nice, but I want you to quantify and qualify those words. Try to see who is the person that I'm looking for. And then most importantly, and this is where it gets really tough, is asking yourself a fundamental question. Am I the complement of the person I'm looking for? Am I really the complement? Which means if I'm looking for a particular thing, it's very nice. I mean, I'm sure in the movies it could work for someone, but am I really the complement of that person? And if I'm not the complement of the person, well, who am I really looking for? What kind of person am I really looking for? And maybe, and I'm, it sometimes, you know, becomes surprising because you say, well, all these years I have been looking for such and such a person. But the truth is that I don't really want that person because I'm not a compliment. I actually don't even value that. That value could have come from, let's say, the movies. And the truth is, if you want a relationship that the beginning, the middle, and the end is exactly two hours, <laughs> a movie, then if you want a two-hour relationship, then look at the movies as an example for what a solid relationship looks like. But if you're looking for something that's longer than two hours, then what ends up happening is you need to ask yourself a fundamental question. Am I the complement of the person I'm looking for? Can I handle that? If I'm, let's say, and there's, there's basic ideas. Let's say, uh, let's use an example like an optimist and a, and a pessimist. Or, uh, yeah, why not? Uh, or, or, nah, an optimist and a pessimist I think would be a bad idea. Let's try an extrovert and an introvert. Very often, and I'm not saying this as, I'm saying this as a generalization because I have to, because we're not just the two of us talking, you know, and if I obviously, if I knew specifically what your question was, then I'd be able to answer that specifically to you. But let's say generally, optimists and pessimists do get along. Why? Because the optimist always wants, you know, is always wanting to go hang out with people and be with people. And the, pe and, and the, um, Sorry, the extrovert and the introvert. Why am I saying optimist and pessimist? The, the extrovert and the introvert. The extrovert always wants to get out and the introvert wants to stay in. So if you're a couple, if you're both introverts, then you're never gonna get out. And if you're both extroverts, then you'll never stay in. So there's a value in that balance. So if you can see, the, the extrovert and the introvert are kind of balance, balancing each other out. So there's a value in that particular, um, in that particular structure. So you're, you're looking for the complement of who you are, which means if you have, let's pretend, and there's like this beautiful Kabbalistic adage that you're the two halves of one whole, and people say this, but what do they really mean when they say this? Is that if you look at you and the person that you're dating as a whole, then the two of you need to be halves, which means you together need to make up a whole person. Someone's asking, what about agreeable people? Should two agreeable people really be together? Um, I think it's a really good question. Should two agreeable people be together? They could be together if they want to live a life of agreeability. 
if really, if for example, if someone is adverse to, to that kind of rupture or to that kind of challenge in their relationship, then I would say that the two of them should be together because that agreeability is, you don't wanna have to put on undue stress onto a relationship. Somebody once said that opposites attract. Men and women by nature are opposites. So you don't have to invent something else that's opposite. So if, if you're the kind of person who doesn't like too much rupture in your life, and I don't think a relationship should have, I mean, there should be a certain amount, but not too much. So you wanna to try to find someone who's complimentary to you. You wanna to try to find someone who is agreeable if that's important, if agreeability is important to you. Usually though, somebody who's looking for someone who's agreeable, it means that they're more stubborn. So there is gonna be a little bit of an opposite there with the agreeability factor. You know, so I often hear people, well, I'm a very agreeable person. I'm so agreeable. I get everything I always wanted. Everything I've always wanted, that's what I get. That's how agreeable I am. Well, that person probably should go with some agreeable person because, you know, you get the point. So going back to this, this second part is who am I? And really having a hard look at yourself. You can just simply look at yourself in relation to the relationship. For example, ask yourself the question, what do I bring to this relationship? If, if someone had to ask you, so what do you bring into this? What, what do you have? What kind of value do you have for this relationship? What would you say to them? And it's hard because it's hard to take that really optimistic, you know, we all love ourselves more than anybody else who could ever love us. I don't know, maybe our mothers, I don't know. But, but really, we love ourselves more than anyone else. So it's really hard to see yourself in that kind of third person view and saying, well, what do I really bring to this relationship? And then, of course, there's the opposite of people who think, oh, well, I'm the greatest thing that ever happened since chicken soup. And the other people who say, well, I don't know if anyone is good enough for me. You know, and so if you think that you're the greatest thing that ever happened since chicken soup, it means there's nothing missing in your life. You don't really need anyone in your life. So you're probably not going to need anyone in your life. And so therefore, there's probably no space in your life for someone else. If you're someone who says, well, I don't know if anyone would ever love me, well, that's about you, not about them. Shira asks, is everyone meant to be married or are some people not meant to be married? Look, it's, it's a tough question because I know that it's really, really difficult. And I do, I live vicariously through a lot of relationships and I, I've seen what's out there and I know it's really, really tough for a lot of people. I do believe that everybody who wants to be married deserves to be married. And I think everyone who wants to be married is meant to be married. But I think there are people out there, for whatever reason, they don't want. And I think if you don't want that at this point in your life, no one should force you. Nobody should say, you have to be married. You have to do this right now. No, it could be that right now in your life, you're focusing on something else. And we live in a world where we're constantly focusing and there's all these things that are grabbing our attention at all times. And so you have to decide how important is a relationship for me right now. And I, and I really believe that you have to need it. You have to, you know, the Talmud says you have to look for it like something that you're missing. Like literally you lost something and you should look for it like you lost something. So if you look, if you think of marriage, that you're looking for that man or you're looking for that woman like you lost something, well, I don't know if you ever lost your car keys or you ever lost your, your phone you go crazy, like I, I can't go to sleep at night. I, I, I don't even know what to do with myself because I lost this. You ask the way you have to look at it. It has to be so important to you. It can't be also. It can't be something else you're doing. It has to be what's important to you right now and maybe the most important thing to you right now. And that's tough. You know, I think if you think about it and you're honest with yourself, if, if you're asking that question, is everyone meant to be married, then I'm gonna say that probably you're not thinking that's the most important thing in your life right now. Let's move on. Here's my third thought. Don't take yourself too seriously. The less you try to impress, the more you will. I think that dating should be an educated, yet pleasurable experience. The funny thing is, that the harder you try, the less you're gonna succeed. 
the more, the more you just say, okay, it is what it is. Now, I'm not saying that that's the way you should go when you're looking for someone. I'm talking about when you're on the date. When you're actually dating someone, very often people are like, I don't know, is this the person? This could be it. This could be it. I've been waiting so long for this. This could be the one. And all of a sudden, all the blinkers go up. It's like going to one of these Jewish events. I, I, I look at these, like, I call them meat markets, like some of these Jewish events. And you see people, like, everyone's looking. Oh, they're Jewish. And they have eyes. And they have a mouth. And they have, oh my gosh, this could be the one. This could be the one that I've been waiting for my whole life. And all of a sudden, we have all of these defense mechanisms that go up because I've been waiting for this my entire life. And this could be the one. Well, I guarantee you there's no way you're going to be able to get into an honest, real relationship if all your defense mechanisms go up. It's really hard right now, for example, for me to be talking to a, a, a screen. I mean, I, I, I can't see you on the other side watching this. But what I do know is that if all my defense mechanisms went up, I wouldn't be able to properly convey what I'm trying to convey to you. Well, I think the same thing is in a relationship. We, we, we're constantly trying to think about all the defense mechanisms. I, I'll, I'll suggest somebody to someone, and I know what they're doing. They're going on Facebook or they're going on social somewhere, and they're looking the person up, and then they figured out every reason why this date is not going to work, why this person is not for them. And I understand. A lot of us have been burned. It's been really hard. We don't want to get our hopes up too much because then what ends up happening is we get burned again and again and again. And how many times can somebody suggest someone for you and you're like, oh, somebody else? Oh my gosh, this other person? What am I going to do? Well, if that's the thought process and if that is how you're going to feel, you're going to be a self-fulfilling prophet. What's probably going to end up happening is all of the, the, the people you're going to date, you're going to automatically try to figure out what's wrong with that person. And I encourage you somehow, some way, to be more relaxed when you're on that date and say, don't be, oh my gosh, this could be the one, this person is Jewish and whoa, whoa. And also the opposite. Don't be the opposite. Oh, I don't know. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna put on my defense mechanism. It's not gonna work anyway. I mean, I'll give it a shot. I mean, what does a cup of coffee hurt or a beer, whatever. But the truth is, is that you have to be somewhere in the middle. Definitely you have to go there with an open mind and say, I'm going to try to experience, I'm going to try to allow the fullness of myself to experience this particular date or this particular relationship. And then, at the same time, you can ask yourself existential questions. You can say, is this person for me? Does this person meet my values? I think that what would be great is if you had a list of what you're looking for beforehand. So that way, you can see, does this person check off my boxes? What bothers me more than anything is people who are married and then they're asking themselves existential questions. They're saying, is this my soulmate? I often have couples that'll sit across from me, they'll say, are we soulmates? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but if you're married, I really hope you're soulmates. I don't think you should be asking yourself existential questions once you're married. Once you're married, you ask yourself, how do we make this work? When you're single, you can say, does this particular person meet my values? And well, I would hope in the dating process, or even before you go on a date, let's say you use a matchmaker, you use someone such as myself, we're gonna wanna know what are those values. So when you're set up with someone, or when you go out with that person, you should already have similar values. That would make sense, I'm assuming. So going back, I want you to take out a piece of paper, and I want you to start off by writing what you're looking for. Just write it all down, every little bit of it, everything. And you can make a long list or you can make a short list. You can spend a day on it, a month on it, a year on it, as long as you want. But once you're done with that list, you need to make sure everything is on there. And don't worry, you, you'll edit it later. Then I want you to take out a second piece of paper. And on the second paper, piece of paper, I want you to ask yourself, who am I and what do I bring to the relationship? What's amazing is once you have those two honest lists in front of you, you can look at these two lists lying in front of you and you can ask yourself, 
can these two people be married? Can the person who I'm looking for and the person who I think I am actually be married to each other? Look at them. Now, what will end up happening is you're gonna see some similarities between the two lists. You're gonna see you know, some things you're looking for and some things you are. And you're gonna kind of start circling those things, those similarities. And when you do, you're gonna end up with a, a real list. I would say maybe six or seven or eight things at most on that list. Once you have that list, and there's more to this than I'm, what I'm telling you, because what I'm saying is make those two lists and then if you want, you can contact me and I'll, I'll help you through the, the rest of the process. But what, what you wanna do is you wanna take that list and put it away. Because where it becomes valuable is when you start asking yourself existential questions about the person you're dating, which means you actually went on a date with someone and you start asking yourself questions about that person. And you're wondering, is this person right for me? Well, hold on a second. Let's make a list of all the values this person has. And then I'm gonna go back to the list that I made before I even met this person. And I'm gonna share those lists and see if those lists match up. So that way you're not worried because the same person who's dating today is the same person who made that list yesterday. And that's gonna be a lot of clarity for yourself. You're not gonna be so, because so often I think that we get into or we get out of relationships for the wrong reasons. And I know that there's obviously a human element to it, but if you're really looking for a long-term relationship, you need to be, have that confidence. And so often, there could be so many reasons why, well, you know, this person is not good for me. Well, why isn't the person good for you? Why is this not working out for you? Why are you having trouble with this? Go back to that list before that person came about. That was where your clarity was. That was where you were thinking clearly. And all of a sudden, you can see, does the person match up with my list? Or does the person not match up with my list? Let's go on. Now, I know you're going to expect this coming from a rabbi because um, this is probably what some Orthodox rabbi has told you in the past. And I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but I just want to state it because it's just so obvious coming from me is don't touch. And there's actually some science behind this. The research behind it is that touch confuses lust with love. And especially when there's so many hormones and so many feelings that are going back and forth between two people and there's the heat and there's the, the chemistry and you add touch to that and it's just so confusing. And so often couples will use touch to kind of catapult the relationship. It goes from one to 10 right away. And as a result of that is you're not actually sure, you never really dealt with the real elements of the relationship because, well, who wants to ruin a good thing? And so either you end up dating to death, which I'll talk about later, or you end up, um, who knows, you know, something else. Let me just turn off the sound here. People are private messaging me things. So I would say don't touch because that would confuse love and lust. Touch is supposed to be sensual. If it's not sensual, then what you've done is you've desensitized yourself. You've become so good at dating, that was what I had said before, that you probably don't even know the value of touch in a relationship. And I would say is maybe you have to reclaim that part of yourself, that part of yourself that's not desensitized to the touch. Touch also so easily, because it blurs the lines between love and lust, that touch ends up really confusing the relationship to the point where you're not even sure what's right and wrong anymore. And this leads to my next part. Don't be afraid to talk serious. I had a, so right now, any of the couples that I marry, I require them to go through a full premarital program. I mean, actually I had this like really existential experience. I was, uh, a couple of years ago, I was standing under the chuppah and I was about to make the blessing over this beautiful couple's marriage that they were standing right in front of me. And I was thinking to myself, what right do I have to bless this union? What did I do to bless this union? 
And it's so funny because in a lot of states and a lot of provinces today, you can actually get a certain amount of money off of your marriage certificate by going for premarital counseling. So I think there's a lot of rabbis, and myself included, who are like writing these letters, yes, I had a meeting with such and such a couple and everything is fine and wonderful, and we went through premarital counseling, but did we? Did we actually have a real relationship? Did I give you a toolbox? Did I set you up for a long-lasting and healthy relationship? Did I do everything in my power? Can I stand under that chuppah and give you a blessing and it really means something? No. And so what I did was I started looking at various programs and today I have a really nice program that I use and I do it with all of my couples that I marry and now I actually require it. I won't do a wedding without um, serious premarital uh, counseling because the truth is, come on, I mean, the, the divorce rate is higher than the marriage rate. And so I believe that as rabbis, we're the first line of defense and we have to do everything in our power to set up a couple for a long lasting and healthy relationship. That's our job. I mean, it's very nice to customize a ceremony and to you know, spend time and even to speak about obviously what's very important, the Jewish marriage laws, you know, the Tarat and I'm not, I'm not belittling that, but I think that as part of that, Tarat Mishbacha program, there also needs to be a toolbox, uh, a communication toolbox, uh, finances, uh, sexual expectations, things that are real issues that come about, especially in the first year of marriage. And then also now what I do is I do a number of follow-ups in the first year of marriage because I know things are gonna come up. And I know a lot of the things that we talk about before the wedding are just hypothetical. And all of a sudden after the wedding, when life really happens, that's when the real questions happen. So. I had this couple, so, so, when, so when the couples come into my office, the first thing they do is they have to fill out individual questionnaires. There, it's a 45 minute individual questionnaire and then what I do is I look at the strengths and weaknesses of the relationship and I give them a full couple evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses of their relationship. So a couple sitting in my office about uh, two months ago and I had looked at their evaluation and I see Simple question, which should have been a serious question they should have talked about. Now, they are now engaged for five months and they were dating for around two years. So you're talking about a couple who knows each other for two and a half years. If you would ask somebody, oh, we know each other for two and a half years, everything is wonderful. Everything is great. I mean, we're getting married, we're all excited. I mean, this is it, the bells and the whistles. This is the greatest moment of our life. So I look at a very simple question. How many children do you want? And I see that she writes three. Wonderful, Mazel tov. He writes zero. And I realize these two people have never had a serious relationship, a serious conversation. They haven't had a serious conversation because who wants to stop something that's really good? It was great, it was wonderful. I'm sure that there was all the excitement and the hormones and this is all, this is a real relationship. So why would I mess up something that's so good by actually having a serious conversation? It's so important, and I don't know how to do it because I know that the way a lot of people are dating today, it's very hard to get into a serious conversation. Like, what do you do? What do you start? Say, okay, um, uh, whatever, uh, Jeff, I wanna have a serious conversation with you tonight. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm not having any serious conversation with you. So I don't know exactly how that works, and I don't have an answer for you, but there needs to be a point as the relationship develops, where you actually at some point have a serious talk. And I would say that serious talk would be earlier than later. I mean, look, if you do it through a matchmaker or a shadchan, I would say that that's the best way to do it because then the shadchan, the matchmaker, can help you decide when is the, a good time to have a serious conversation. But serious conversations are crucial because you don't want to end up, and I want to tell you, that was one of the most difficult conversations I've ever had with a couple. We, we got through it, and they're still engaged. But... Actually, they're married now. But the, the point of it is that why did they have to wait till they were engaged to have what would seem a very basic conversation about how many kids they wanted? And they were really on two different pages when it came to that. Here's my next thought. And again, you're welcome to ask questions. I'm happy to answer your questions. Just go into the, the box on the side of uh, this video here and uh, type in a question. And if you want, uh, I guess you can ask me a private question. I'm not sure how that would happen. Okay, but you're welcome to, you can message me private questions and I can deal with them in a future uh, broadcast. What I want you to also think about 
is looking for your compliment and not looking for your sister. It's supposed to be Mr. Right for me, not Mr. Right. And that's a very big difference. You're not looking for the perfect person. You are looking for the compliment of your soul. It's, as I said before, men and women, they're opposites by nature. Whoever said that opposites attract, we're trying to actually complicate something that's really simple. You're not trying to find your opposite. You're trying to find your compliment, the compliment of your soul, otherwise known as your soulmate. The soulmate actually, it's not just this nice idea that somebody decided, oh, let's uh, start talking about soulmates. It's an actual compliment of your soul. When you know who you are, you're going to recognize who your compliment is. Your date may be good looking, your date may be attractive, but it doesn't mean that they're your compliment. Although the person you're looking for brings many things, those things primarily are superficial because at this point in the relationship, most of it is superficial, as, as meaningful and as real as you try to make it. A soulmate, on the other hand, what a soulmate brings you is actually the most vital thing, the most important thing, and that is the feeling that you are the most special person in the entire world. And that's really, at the end of the day, the most crucial element of what a long-term relationship brings you. That satisfaction of feeling like you're the most special person in the, in the entire world is something so much greater than anything else. And if you've never experienced that in your life, that is what's primarily missing from your life. Let's go on to the next thing. Please feel free to ask questions. I hate when people say, I'm settling down. What does that mean anyway? I'm settling down? How terrible. Okay, I'm gonna do probably what is gonna be the biggest decision of my life. I'm gonna get into a long-term relationship, otherwise known as a marriage. I don't wanna scare you, I don't wanna say the big M word, but I'm gonna do something so important and I'm going to be settling down, really? It's a relationship, not a negotiation. So don't ever settle. I hate it when people say that. What does it mean anyway? Settling? How do you know what's settling and what isn't settling? Dating should never begin with what we have. It must begin with what we lack. You don't get into a relationship because you have something. You get into a relationship because you're missing something. And only by identifying that one big thing that you're missing are you guaranteed to find someone who actually makes you whole. So I encourage you to try to stop thinking. I mean, I know that it's hard for us to think of ourselves outside of ourselves. It's hard for us to think of ourselves outside of that third person. But I'm encouraging you to stop thinking yourself as like you're the greatest thing that ever happened. And I know that we have to stick up for ourselves, we have to be strong characters, and we have to be good. That's also very important. But also you should think of yourself from the third person. Now here's the opposite of that. Stop trying to be your own soulmate. Many people think that no one is ever going to be able to love them as much as they love themselves. We're in this generation of self-sufficient people. We used to rely on others. We used to actually need others. Today, we don't need anything. We have our own jobs. We have our own homes. We can go and afford to go on nice vacations by ourselves. We can do whatever, whatever we need to do, we can do it ourselves. We don't really, truly need anyone. And this independence has been really incredible, I'd say, to the world in general, but it's been terrible to our relationships. Because it used to be that people looked for one big thing in a lifelong partner. Today, what ends up happening is we're looking for a lot of little things. Because people who are financially independent, they have a greater choice in their lifestyle. What ends up happening is they have to make this long laundry list of things that they want in their marriage. Many people today feel smug about themselves and they're rarely looking to actually share their lives, at least less superficially than social media. Like that's what you're doing here right now anyway, right? 
We don't feel this great need to search for our own soul and never mind our soulmate. So, and I know it's gonna happen, and I've said it many times before. I know somebody one day is gonna come to me and say, I've thought about it long and hard, and I'd like you, Rabbi, to marry me to myself. And you could, based on that question that I got from someone before, it could be that you can be your own soulmate. And if you are your own soulmate, don't clog up the system. Don't start dating if you don't think there's anyone out there for you. You have to look for that person. You have to need that person. And if you're not missing anything in your life, then you have to ask yourself, what am I missing? And you have to create that missing. And it could mean that you have to clear out half of your closet and you have to sit at one chair at your table and you have to sleep on one side of your bed. You may have to physically do those things to say, is there really something missing in my life? And I'm gonna end off with this one. Uh, you know what, I'll, I'll do two more. Love is not tit for tat. Don't keep track. Oh, you did this for me, I did this for you. That's not what relationships are about. Relationships, relationships are about being there 100% for the other person. It's not 50-50 and I'm gonna keep track of how make sure that we're all fair, this relationship is fair. It's about truly being there for someone else. And my last thought is, and I know I speak about this probably more often than anything else, but I really believe in this, don't date to death. I have seen so many relationships that have been dated to death. It means they were great, they're good for each other. They just, someone didn't make the move. Someone didn't allow the relationship to progress and go to the next level. A couple of months ago, a woman came to me and said, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, this guy is not proposing. So I looked at her and I said, we live in a world of equality. Go buy him a watch, get down on one knee and propose to him. And you know what? She did it and he said yes. If, you, if you're the one who sees the relationship is getting to the point where, where what I call dating to death, then do something about it because it will date to death. It will end up, oh, for whatever reason, the relationship won't work out. So if it's something that you're so passionate about and it's something that you see, then make the move. And I think that there's so often there's great people who are, are really meant for each other and they really could be perfect together, but because of whatever is happening in our society, they're not making that move. They're not allowing the relationship to progress. They're not allowing the relationship to go to the next level. And that's where you come in. You have to say, okay. This is my relationship, this is my life, and I'm gonna take control of it. The same way that I'm gonna look out for myself, I have to also look out for our relationship. And again, he or she is the complement of your soul, and you know it's right, and don't allow that relationship to progress to the point where you're like, what just happened? And why did something amazing just slip from my fingers? Just because of circumstance. Those are my thoughts for today. I'm well, I welcome any of your questions and I'm gonna start doing these uh, more because I keep on getting all these questions from people and I'll just every so often take all the different questions that you're asking me and I'll come on and we'll do a Facebook Live. Oh, we have one more question and I'll, I'll take that question. The question is I always go, on in, I go into a date with the intention of completely opening up. Yet once the person is in front of me, my filters and defense mechanisms go right up and I can't bring them down as I really just want the day to go positively, any strategies for this? So I think, um, what's your name? Jeremy, I think that this is a very common uh, issue that happens a lot, is you, know, you have these, all these ideas of how the date is gonna progress, and we often have these expectations of how the date is gonna progress. So what I would say to you is, the first thing is, get rid of the expectations. Go into, don't go into the date with the intention of completely opening up. Go into the date without any expectations. I am just gonna be myself. If I had it my way, I would date, set up every date blindly. Like where the point where the guy has to come onto the date and say, excuse me, what's your name? Because that way you can't think beforehand of all the problems and all the things are gonna go wrong. If you really wanna go on a date positively, don't go with any expectations. Just allow the date to happen. I mean, you can plan what we're gonna do, you can plan where it's gonna go. If you're a guy, I know the girls like that, wonderful. But outside of that, don't have any other expectations. And I think that if the defense mechanism is going up, 
then try to think to yourself, why is my defense mechanism going up and how can I relieve that part of myself? How can I allow that defense mechanism to go down? Is it because maybe this is the one and you're like, oh my gosh, this could be the one, this could be the one that I've been looking for for all this time? Relax. I think by hyping yourself up, you're doing a lot more harm than good. And that's my strategy for that. It looks like there's no other questions. Maybe, oh, wait a second. Otherwise, I'll definitely, please, if you see this later, I'll see your questions. I'm very happy to answer your questions in later broadcasts. Thanks for joining me today, and uh, uh, good luck. Have a great day.